Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Vinu Sandhu. Let's take a look at the stories for the day. The government gave a lifeline to Vodafone idea, saving it from an imminent collapse. After deferring statutory dues, the telco has agreed to issue equity to the government against interest dues on its liabilities. Now, what does this move mean for the company, for the markets and for the government? This report finds out more. The government taking a 35.8% holding on Vodafone idea has surprised many. At a time when it looked poised to dilute its stakes in many public sector companies, the move failed to excite the street too, as the cash-strapped company's shares dropped 21% yesterday. Experts also pointed out that ailing government-owned telecom giants MTNL and BSNL are also crying for attention. They are yet to roll out 4G services. But the move may well give Vodafone idea a lease of life. The third largest telecom carrier's fundraising plans are significantly delayed, and Vodafone Group has made it clear it will not make any fresh equity infusion into its Indian unit. Against this backdrop, the government of India is set to become the single largest shareholder in struggling Vodafone idea. After the telco opted to convert interest worth Rs 16,000 crore on deferred spectrum liabilities and adjusted gross revenue dues into equity, it had previously accepted a four-year moratorium on spectrum and AGR dues offered by the government's telecom reforms package announced last September. While Airtel had chosen to pay the interest arising out of such deferment, Vodafone Idea is taking advantage of the relief package to convert them into equity. This will result in a massive dilution to existing shareholders. The government will hold some 35.8% stake in India's third biggest carrier. The Vodafone Group will own around 28.5% and Aditya Birla Group about 17.8%. While this may provide comfort to financial creditors, at the same time, it places an undue expectation on the government for any future fund infusions, as it has consciously chosen to be part of the company's turnaround. As of September end, Vodafone Idea had a gross debt of 1.94 trillion rupees, 90% of which it owes to the government. The company's decision crucially prevents a duopoly in the telecom market, which was ostensibly the intent of the telecom reforms package. Business standard Surajit Dasgupta tells us what this means for the industry. Yeah, basically one thing uh, is now very clear that uh, Vodafone is here to stay. We'll have three players. And therefore, uh, if Vodafone can uh, control its loss of subscribers, in a year they lost around over 25 million. And if they can successfully move people from 3G to 4G, then uh, ambition of companies like Reliance Geo, which were looking at hitting 500 million numbers and dominating the market, that will be very difficult now. Also, the, uh, the reason why a lot of companies earlier uh, were against uh, doing a tariff hike was primarily this. They, while they uh, said something and yeah, publicly, but they were not going in for a tariff fight because uh, they wanted to grab as many customers as possible from uh, Vodafone. While this move has helped the company extinguish some dues, the government holding has evidently unsettled investors. Prime Minister Narendra Modi had declared last February that government has no business to be in business. Vodafone idea should not be allowed to remain a quasi-public sector company for long. While the government may become the largest shareholder, it may not get involved in running of the company. JST Investments Aditya Kondavar explained the implication of the development on the company and the government. I believe it's like kicking the can down the road. Let's be very upfront here. The 16,000 crore dues that have been converted into 35.8% equity shareholding of Vodafone Idea by government is just the interest on the dues. So the, the thing is, see, we all know that uh, telecom sector is the cash guzzling one. Now the thing is, uh, government coming in, uh, see, the thing is, it's all shooting in the dark as of now. Uh, the government has uh, maybe diverted a crisis and Vodafone Idea does survive uh, for a couple of more years, that's for sure. 
but the thing is you know uh, telecom uh, is a cutthroat business uh, it's a capital intensive business they have to spend on spectrum they have to spend on capex says they have to uh, you know spend on the customer service they have to stay relevant to the uh, consumers and we all know that you know what upon idea has been having a lot of operational problems as well so i believe that despite the government coming in and becoming the single largest shareholder the task for what of an idea remains an uphill one so uh, i don't see it as a really game changer event uh, as such for what of an idea operationally and financially so yeah. it goes on to be seen how uh, if and when the government infuses more capital it becomes a political issue as well so i feel that definitely the government should have an exit uh, strategy in mind as well uh, if and if they are able to turn around the company and they are able to generate a good return on their investments so why not i mean of course it can be a plan of the divestment target as well because not uh, not in the mid term or the long term future yeah. but a very long term future <laughs> they can think about it why not yeah in an earlier interaction with business standard vodafone idea ceo ravinder tucker had said that it would be incorrect to state that the company will turn into a public sector undertaking he said the government has no interest in acquiring and running telecom companies The government will also have an option to convert the due amount pertaining to the deferred payments into equity at the end of the 4 year moratorium period. In the absence of any significant external fundraising by the company, such a scenario would mean the government becoming a controlling shareholder. Nevertheless, it should soon come up with an exit strategy for its stake. Its support provides short-term relief and stability, but over the long term, it needs to be ensured that Vodafone Idea does not go the Air India way. Vodafone Idea is in a better position to raise funds now and so are online grocers owing to the pandemic. Of late, online grocers such as Big Basket and new entrants in the quick commerce space such as Swiggy have been looking at the community buying model in social commerce to expand online grocery in tier 4 and 5 markets. But what is the community buying model? How is it different from the traditional reseller model in social commerce? and does social commerce hold the key to expand the share of online shopping in the total food grocery apparel and consumer electronics retail trade in the country let's find out in this report online shopping through flipkart and amazon has become second nature for city dwellers but it's often a dilemma for consumers in tier 4 and 5 markets This is why despite the growing hype around e-commerce it only accounted for 4% of the total food and grocery apparel and consumer electronics retail trade in India in 2020 this share is projected to grow to 8% by 2025 for indian e-commerce startups tapping into the consumers living in rural and suburban india or bharat as it is often called seems like the final piece of the puzzle this is where social commerce comes in As the name suggests, social commerce is commerce through social media. Startups such as Meesho, Mall 91, Deal Share and City Mall among others make use of a network of community leaders or resellers. The resellers collect orders from their social networks by sharing product catalogs over WhatsApp. By placing bulk orders for groceries and other daily essentials, these resellers get the items at attractive discounts from wholesalers. This model of social commerce helps startups drive down customer acquisition costs since they leverage the social connections of their resellers. The model also helps them make online small ticket purchases viable. Other apprehensions associated with online commerce such as lack of trust and poor digital literacy are also mitigated through social commerce. Perhaps this is why online grocery platforms such as Big Basket and new entrants in the quick commerce space such as Swiggy are looking at social commerce to grow the user base we spoke to sorjendu medda of social commerce startup deal share to understand more about the two different models of social commerce namely the reseller model and the community buying model now in a pure play reseller model what one does is appoint resellers and then the resellers in turn are basically bringing consumers on the network and taking the responsibility of their daily purchases in turn they are getting some margins in a in a country like india where uh, basically the gross margins are low most of the times this reseller model ends up being a b2b business 
where a retailer becomes a reseller and is basically selling to his or her existing customers. The real social commerce is the community building model or uh, consumer group buying model or, or whatever we say. So on the community building models, what we do is essentially uh, incentivize customers or, or actually micro incentivize customers, very small incentives uh, that we give uh, to customers to basically bring more and more consumers from their network onto the platform so through various uh, gamification and virality driven techniques. So we incentivize for just sharing, sharing of deals, sharing of events on the app. Uh, and those will be very small incentives, minor amounts, right? But the consumers will accumulate those incentives. Similarly, there is a lot of incentives for uh, bringing referrals or bringing new consumers on the platform. Uh, there are gamified properties where customers can bargain along with their friends, uh, basically buy along with their network and, and hence get a lot of savings. So it's an inventory based model where we buy from suppliers and sell to customers. Now, uh, essentially what it means is that there is margin involved in the transaction between buying and selling. So uh, 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 now the way we differentiate from other e-commerce players with inventory model is that we depend heavily on small and medium manufacturers. So we our business is uh, not very dependent on top brands like uh, uh, like you see in other uh, platforms on the grocery and essential space. So uh, in the other platforms or other apps would have around 80% dependence on top brands, whereas 70% of our business is through small and medium manufacturers in the grocery and essential space. Now that allows us a 10 to 20% higher gross margin profile uh, than, than those who are dependent on uh, basically top brands. The reseller model being espoused by Indian social commerce startups offers a blast from the past. It's the same model that Tupperware and Amway leveraged to create a network of self-empowered businesswomen. However, the newer community buying model is the one that startups such as Pinduoduo pioneered in the smaller towns of China. Interestingly, Chinese venture capital firm Shunwei Capital, which counts Pinduoduo among its portfolio companies, is now sharing its social commerce know-how as an investor in Misho, the only unicorn in this space in India. The social commerce market, though nascent, accounted for $2 billion in gross merchandise value or GMV in 2020 and is expected to grow to $16 to $20 billion by 2025. The share of social commerce in India's e-commerce market is expected to increase from the existing 1% to 2% to 4-5% to of the projected $140 billion market by 2025. However, the market is not without its challenges. While VC firms are betting heavily on the sector, they understand that it is a risky proposition. Some experts feel that while the community buying model may see early traction in India, the bigger challenge lies in the manufacturing quality. As the Indian manufacturing sector is not evolved, products are of mediocre quality that will lead to higher customer returns, making it a loss-making proposition. As such, only categories such as groceries and daily essentials may succeed under the group buying model. For the larger social commerce trend, only time will tell if it is the final piece in the puzzle that is enabling online shopping for Bharat. Online grocers may well tap the unexplored markets in small towns where traditional Kiranas are still calling the shots. Moving on, let's see how the IT giants are placed ahead of the quarterly results. The October-December quarter is generally a low season for the Indian IT companies such as Infosys and TCS due to furloughs in its majority markets. But analysts expect the third quarter of FI 2022 to be an exception this time. That apart, what are the factors that will guide the markets today and how should you trade Voda idea after yesterday's crash? Watch this report to know more. December quarter earnings are set to gain steam with large cap companies beginning to report their results today onwards. Kickstarting the earnings season are IT majors Infosys, TCS and Wipro that will release their report cards later today. 
The third quarter is usually a low season for the IT services industry in India due to furloughs in its majority markets, the US and Europe. But analysts expect the third quarter of FY22 to be an exception this time, owing to demand for high digital transformation expenditure and a greater discretionary spend. Though the increased cost of hiring, rising salaries and lower working days may affect margins, many analysts say a falling rupee in relation to the dollar can help. Overall, the street is expecting the revenue of top-tier companies to grow 2.5 to 6%, with Infosys leading the chart in organic growth. According to global brokerage Jefferies, Infosys growth could be impacted by seasonal softness, although deal ramp-ups should help drive 3.7% quarter-on-quarter revenue growth in constant currency. Overall, the rupee revenue may rise up to 19% year-on-year and 4.5% quarter-on-quarter to 30,926 crore rupees. The net profit, meanwhile, may grow up to 10% year-on-year and 5.4% quarter-on-quarter to 5,713 crore rupees. As regards TCS, the Tata Group Crown Jewel may register over 16% yearly rise in rupee revenue at 48,822 crore rupees, while the net profit could swell over 14% year-on-year at 10,126 crore rupees. EBIT margin is expected to stay above 25%. Wipro, meanwhile, could report rupee revenue growth in the range of 20,300 crore rupees to 20,368 crore rupees. Like peers, its EBIT margin is likely to take a hit due to salary hikes and may fall around 400 basis points year on year. That said, with large deals becoming fewer and consulting revenue growing faster than outsourcing revenue, the street will watch for what the firms say on the demand outlook. Earnings of nine other small cap companies, stock specific news flows, retail inflation and IIP data and investors assessment of the COVID-19 situation will drive the markets today. Yesterday, equity markets ended higher for the third straight day amid hopes that India Inc. will post robust earnings for the December quarter. The BSE Sensex ended 221 points higher at 60,617 level, while the Nifty 50 settled at 18,056, up 52 points. In three days, both the benchmarks are up 1.4% each. One of the most active stocks on the bourses yesterday was that of Vodafone Idea. The shares bucked the firm market trend and plunged 21% after the company decided to convert interest on deferred spectrum and adjusted gross revenue dues into equity at par value of 10 rupees per share. With this, the government is set to become the largest shareholder of Vodafone Idea, holding around 35.8% of the total outstanding shares of the company. According to analysts at Ambit Securities, the event won't change the VIL's competitiveness as the government has made it clear that it won't infuse funds in the company. Nonetheless, the stock still looks firm on charts as yesterday's sharp intraday fall failed to dismantle the bullish bias. According to technical charts, the stock has consistently seen heavy volumes above the breakout level of 14 rupees. Volumes will further increase above the next hurdle of 17 rupees. While this happens, the momentum may see the stock rally towards 21 rupees and 23 rupees, which is a 35% upside from current levels. After markets, let us see how the government is gearing up to deal with another wave of the pandemic. According to the Delhi government, 35 out of 46 people who succumbed to COVID-19 between Wednesday and Saturday last week were not vaccinated at all. This analysis has re-emphasized the ever-increasing need for vaccination. Beginning Monday, the central government rolled out the booster of precautionary dose of COVID-19 vaccine for senior citizens with comorbidities. Healthcare and frontline workers too are getting the third shot. Our next report tells us more about this precautionary dose. Most of us got our second and last jab months ago. Experts say that the immunity offered by COVID-19 vaccines wanes with time. So, 
as the third wave is threatening to take the world into its grip again. Nations are mulling administering a third dose or the booster dose to their citizens. And India, which on Tuesday logged 1.68 lakh new COVID-19 cases and 277 deaths, has started administering the booster dose to those above 60 years of age with comorbidities and frontline workers. Meanwhile, there is no consensus on whether the booster shot should be different from the earlier two jabs that one had. Citing several experts, Down to Earth magazine recently said in an article that there is no peer-reviewed study in India on the efficacy of mixing vaccines. In July last year, the World Health Organization's chief scientist Soumya Swaminathan had advised against mixing and matching COVID-19 vaccines. She said such decisions should be left to public health authorities. On the other hand, pointing to a study in the UK, BBC had last year said that a mix and match approach appears to give good protection against the pandemic virus. Some other studies have suggested that mixing and matching vaccines offers an even better immune response than using the third dose of the same series. Back home, the Indian government is staying away from the mix and match policy for the booster dose for now. According to an Imperial College London report, for those fully vaccinated with COVID shield, protection against fresh infection caused by the Omicron variant is just 3%, protection against serious disease caused by Omicron is 18%, and against death 29%. Now, with a booster dose, this will increase to 80% protection against serious disease and 88% against death. Medical experts have also suggested that the government should reduce the gap between the two doses of vaccines from the present 84 days or 12 to 16 weeks. This would ensure speedier full vaccination of the entire eligible adult population. The center though hasn't taken any decision on that front yet. Meanwhile, it has said that the interval between the second and third doses will be 9 months. The decision to keep the interval between the second and third doses at 9 months has been based on the findings of five scientific studies carried out by the Indian Council of Medical Research or ICMR and the Translational Health Science and Technology Institute, Faridabad. The third shot or the booster dose will for sure offer some shield to the elderly and frontline workers from this ongoing wave of the pandemic. The government's assessment that the hospitalization rate stands at 5 to 10 percent offers some solace, but it has also warned that the situation is dynamic and fluid and the requirement for hospital treatment may alter swiftly. The advisors do not let your guard down at any cost. That's all for today. We will be back tomorrow morning with more news and analysis. Stay tuned and thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.